Hey Crossings, thanks for joining us. I was reminded that there is this old Episcopal priest that said the calling of the church is to place itself where God is already at work. The calling of the church is to place itself where God is already at work. So I think my hope and prayer this morning for our community as we gather again virtually in all of our separate places is to remember to pay attention to the places God is already at work in your home, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, because that is ultimately the calling of what it means to be the church. So thanks for joining us. Again, if, if you are Watching this, I think one of the biggest things I've been surprised about in, in this whole COVID season doing these YouTube videos is when we met back together in person, the number of people that said that I had never met before and they introduced themselves and said, hey, I, I've been watching this on YouTube. I've been joining you guys on YouTube um, and here I am, here's my name. Uh, it's been so fun to get these people's stories. Uh, so cool to see that things are happening in people that we get to be part of. Um, God is doing things in people all over the city that we get to be part of that we've not even met. So if that is you, if you have kind of been joining us through these videos um, this whole time, don't hesitate to reach out. Don't hesitate to get a hold of me or one of our other people on staff. We would love to meet you and get your story. Uh, we just so appreciate you kind of joining us in this work of prayer, uh, of worship, of study, of taking common meal, uh, even from a distance. So thanks again for joining us. Um, this will kind of be our last uh, study before we enter into our big long fall study of the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah that we will begin next week when we meet in person uh, in the square room at Chris and Barry. We will also continue to, to provide this YouTube for you all. So um, would you sing with us this morning? God is my shepherd, I won't be wanting, I won't be wanting. He makes me rest in fields of green, with quiet streams. Even though I Death in dying. I will not fear, cause you are with me, you are with me. Your shepherd's staff comforts me, you are my feet. In the presence of enemies, surely goodness will follow me, follow me in the house of God forever. God is my shepherd, I won't be wanting, I won't be wanting. He makes me rest in fields of green, a quiet stream. Even though I Death in dying I will not fear Cause you are with me You are with me Your shepherd 
the question have you ever been afraid or scared before yes um i definitely have been uh what helped you during those moments of being afraid or scared um for me sometimes it's reaching out to another strong person or a trusted person that i know because sometimes uh, when I, I oftentimes feel afraid or scared when I don't really know what's going to happen next. Or I always like to know what I'm going to do. I like to know first I do this when I wake up, then I do this, then I go and do this. Um, I like to have kind of routines. So when things keep changing all the time, like a lot of things are now, I can start to become afraid. And so one thing that we've heard over and over and over again throughout so many stories of the Bible is a repeated phrase that oftentimes Jesus said. Do you remember what that phrase is? No. Do, Do not, not be afraid. Be afraid. Oh. God wants us to know he's with us at all times and the good moments and in the scary or sad moments and that God loved us so much that he came to be with us through Jesus and Jesus do you know what since Jesus lived amongst us he had the same fears in life that we do but the thing about Jesus was those fears never took root in his soul because Jesus knew how to connect with God and how to connect with the people of God so completely that that love overcame all of his fears. Now, there's a book in the Bible called Psalms. Can you say that? Psalms. And it's a book in the Bible that's kind of a collection of songs or poems, and each of them expresses sadness or fears or joys to God. And those are prayers. They're a way to tell God how we're feeling. And so this morning, we're going to read a psalm. We're going to read Psalm 23. Um, you can find it in your Jesus Storybook Bible. There's also um, by Sally Lloyd-Jones. She wrote a book called Found. But I want you to do a few motions. When you hear the word feed, I want you to pretend to be eating. Can you do that? When you hear the word guide, I want you to move your hand. When I say the word looks, I want you to look around. When I say lying still, I want you to rest your head. And when I say strong, I want you to show me your muscles. Okay, so let's do it again. Feed, guide, looks, lying still, strong. All right, so I'm going to read this and I want you to do those motions as I'm reading it. God is my shepherd and I am his little lamb. He feeds me, he guides me, he looks after me. I have everything I need. Inside, my heart is very quiet, as quiet as lying still in soft green grass and a meadow by a little stream. And even when I walk through the dark, scary, lonely places, I won't be afraid because my shepherd knows where I am. He is here with me. He keeps me safe. He rescues me 
He makes me strong and brave. Oh, forgot to do strong and brave. He is getting wonderful things ready for me, especially for me. Everything I have ever dreamed of, he fills my heart so full of happiness I can't hold it all inside. So wherever I go, I know. God's never stopping, um, unbreaking, always and forever love will go to. Now I wonder what part of those Psalms did you think was most important? Of that psalm, sorry. Lying still. And I wonder what part of this psalm might help you with the fears of your week. Probably um, um, when you say, when he says strong. How to be strong. And I wonder just what part of that psalm you liked the best. Probably when he, he says strong. Strong to remind us we have that strength, right? Well, let's go ahead and let's pray. God, help us to remember and experience that you are indeed with us in the dark and the scary and the lonely places. Help us to not be afraid, and may your love and being with your people overcome our fears. And in Jesus' name, amen. Shalom. I have a loose tooth. You do. Hey, Crossings, thanks for uh, joining us today uh, via YouTube. We're grateful you take the time, grateful that you pause for just a moment and worship with us and kind of enter into the Word and table and ascending. And so uh, thanks for being here. Luke, uh, the New Testament book of Luke, chapter 2, describes a fascinating scene. It's not, not the birth of Jesus. That's a fascinating scene. All very good. But... Luke chapter 2 that I want to read to you right now is a scene that um, it's the only scripture we have that describes Jesus growing up. Here's Luke 2. I'm going to start with verse 41. <clears throat> Every year during Jesus' childhood, his parents traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration. So it was a yearly thing. Uh, multiple festivals throughout the year. Uh, they would go to Jerusalem. This happened all the time. When Jesus was 12, he made the journey with them, 12 years old. They spent several days there, participating in the whole celebration. When his parents left for home, Jesus stayed in Jerusalem, but Joseph and Mary were not aware. They assumed Jesus was elsewhere in the caravan, because that's not like Dodge Caravan, that's like the caravan of people. They, they assumed he was elsewhere in the caravan that was traveling together. So let's be a little easy on Joseph and Mary here. It wasn't like hey, they're traveling in the minivan and they just didn't notice there was, wasn't a kid in the back seat. That's not what's going on. They're traveling as a community. So you could say it's bad parenting. That's not the point of this anyway. It's actually very easy to see how it could happen. Well, Joseph and Mary, realizing what's happened, they've already traveled one full day home. Uh, they rush back and they begin to look for their 12-year-old son. Here's verse 46. After three days of separation, they finally found him, sitting among a group of religious teachers in the temple, asking them questions, listening to their answers. Everyone was surprised and impressed that a 12-year-old boy could have such deep understanding and could answer questions with such wisdom. His parents, of course, had a different reaction. <laughs> Mary said, son, why have you treated us this way? Listen, your father and I have been sick with worry for the last three days wondering where you were, looking everywhere for you. And then Jesus said, why did you not, why did you need to look for me? Didn't you know that I must be working for my father? So not earthly, but heavenly father. So here as Jesus enters the teenage years, he begins to stand out as someone with an extraordinary identity and calling. He's not just Mary and Joseph's boy. He, he has a different relationship with God. And and he was there to do something very specific. I think, and I feel very strongly about this, I think Jesus came to give the people at that time and at that place a picture of God that they had never seen or experienced before. In fact, and, and I know this is a hotly debated topic among theological circles in terms of asking the question, why did Jesus come when he did? I believe that what I just gave is actually the answer to the question. When people ask, why did he come and what was he trying to accomplish? My answer, and feel free to disagree here, 
my answer, my, actually my foundational understanding of this, is that Jesus came to give the people at that time, in that place, a picture of God they had never seen or experienced before. And not just at that time, but at this time. So the same question, I think, can be asked in the Bible, uh, the story of God. Because it has so much, uh, it is so much the source of disagreement and division. The Bible, uh, and again, feel free to disagree with me here. I believe that the Bible uh, was given, as hard as it is sometimes to grasp, and regardless of how horrifically it's used in our world uh, for so many wrong things, I believe the Bible exists. I believe we have it to give us a picture of God that we have never seen before. I believe that's what Jesus was doing with the religious leaders in those three days in the temple. I think Jesus was giving answers. I think he was asking questions. I think he was talking about scripture. I think he was talking about the story of God. I think he was displaying a wisdom of all of this unlike anything they had ever seen before. He was giving, Jesus was giving them a different picture of God than they'd ever seen before. I am really, really tired of the chaos that seems to surround us today. Um, we all are going through it. It seems like everywhere we turn, everywhere we look, we see some form of chaos. And, and every day of our lives, it seems like, okay, I just need a little order in the midst of this. I need a little order in the midst of whether it's individually, communally, uh, societally, culturally, whatever it is. And I believe we are desperate to make sense of the senselessness. I think we are desperate to find meaning in the meaninglessness. We, we want a way <laughs> that will help us sort out this season uh, that we're living through. And I believe, the way I would word it, is I believe that we're all trying to find a narrative to live within. I think we're trying to find a story to live that brings meaning and hope to the chaos. It's in the story that we inhabit then, the story that we live in, that we believe and live, that we can find meaning and hope. We are all just trying to find a story that makes sense of it all. I really absolutely believe that. So when it comes to, look, I pulled out a real Bible. So when it comes to the Bible then, when it comes to this book, when you look at, at and think about the Bible, what is it? Because because this time that we take in our gathering each week is, we call it the Word. What are we, what is it that you're actually seeing? What is it that we're actually experiencing when we enter into the Word? Well, the responses are all across the spectrum. Some see this as just full of uh, beliefs and doctrines. In order to understand what you believe, uh, in order to understand the right way to think, you go here. Some see it as a crazy book that utters sentences, especially in the Old Testament, at random intervals and thinks it's very nonsensical. I, I get that. Some see a book designed to answer all the questions we could ask, including historical and scientific and relational. Some see it that way. Some see the Bible as something that helps um, the medicine go down. Let's, let's call it that. God has told you what to do. Uh, now you must do it. If you read this Bible, it will help it go down. It'll help you understand it. Well, for us as a community at Crossings, if, if you're not aware, what we believe about the scripture is that it is incomprehensible unless you understand how it fits into the story, the grand narrative that we all that we are all a part of. We believe, and these are the words of Leon Cass. It's on the screen for you. That the veracity and the authority of the Bible does not lie with typical literary metrics, but instead is a story that not only happened once, but is happening still. It is a truly great story whose true power lies not in the scientific, historical, philosophical, anthropological, artistic, or moral truths, not those, but whose great power is seen in its effect on the soul of the reader. And so we gather together here, and when we do, one of the things we try to do is enter into this grand story so that we might experience his power, that we might see God differently. 
N.T. Wright, New Testament scholar, says, quote, throw a rule book at people's heads or offer them a list of doctrines, and they can duck or avoid it or simply disagree and go away. Tell them a story, though, he says, and you invite them to come into a different world. In this story of God, we are not only being given a way to make sense of the chaos, which I think we are, but we are being invited into a different world that has the potential to change everything. Uh, there's a book Rob Bell wrote called What is the Bible? It's these little essays about ways people look at the scripture. And let me quote from it. It says, the Bible is an unfolding narrative. The story is going somewhere. It's headed somewhere. I read it looking for what the story is doing, what's happening within it, what new perspective is emerging, what new idea is being presented, what sense is being heightened. The stories in the Bible, and the Bible itself, have an arc, a trajectory, a movement, and momentum like all great stories have. So I don't know if you've thought about the scriptures in that way, that it has an arc, a trajectory, a movement. And so we've said this over and over for years here in our community. We read the story of God as an unfolding narrative, that we are moving somewhere. We read the story on our way to where it's headed. We don't edit out the uh, earlier bits, like in the Hebrew part, the, the Old Testament part, or pretend like they're not there. We try not to. They reflect how people understood things in that time and in that place, and, and we try to acknowledge that. And we read the stories in light of where they are headed, grand story. And so if the Bible is an unfolding narrative, then I believe to enter in, I think it makes sense that our faith, our trust in God, who is the center of the story, that should be something that continues to unfold. That should be something that continues to move. So a question to consider would be, when you think about your belief, your trust in God, um, it may be this much or it might be this much. You may have done it for your whole life or you may have done it for the past week. I don't know. But where are you moving? <clears throat> what is unfolding? Do you allow the story to invite you, as N.T. Wright said, do you, do you allow the story to invite you into a different world? And most importantly, are you getting a picture of God that you've never seen before? We're going to begin next week uh, a study of the book of Jeremiah. It's in the Hebrew Scriptures, in the Old Testament. We want you to know, when it comes to this story, this big story that we find in the book of Jeremiah, we will do our best to curate it well. I like the word curate here. Um, we don't use the word curate a lot when it comes to talking about the Bible. Uh, curate means to uh, take, take, take care of it, control it, manage it, put it in the right place, put it, look at it the right way. But curate... Um, we're always curating scripture. We are, all of us are. It's always managed and controlled and it can be negative and it can be positive. And each of us, again, whether we believed for a day or our whole life, each of us curates our own scripture. The author, preacher, Barbara Brown Taylor says, if someone wants to talk to me about the Bible, I say, all right, do you have a Bible? And then I tell them, hold it up and let me see where the dark pages are. Now, I don't know how that works in Bible Gateway, but let's not worry about that. So she says, hold up, the, hold up this book and let me see where the dark pages are, where, where are the pages that you've handled a lot, where you go all the time. That will show me how you curate the text. Okay, that doesn't have to be literal, but think about that. Because denominations and churches curate their own text. We all have tendencies to manage, control it, divide it up, hand it out, to support people in power who want to think, who want to view it in a certain way. We, we curate it to support certain theologies. There's a multitude of reasons that we end up curating the scripture. We all have an approach to the Bible where we privilege certain things, where we highlight certain things, and we curate the story to our own liking, our own background. This is where, this is where our baggage comes from. And some of us have so much baggage when it comes to to God and to Scripture, we cannot let our poor curation change the story. We can't, we can't allow that to happen. We must let the story instead change us, to unfold, to give us a different picture. It's why we have this thing. 
So here's Barbara Brown Taylor again. I'll put this quote on the screen. I hear stories about students being discouraged from taking a religious course in college because it will, quote, make them lose their face, faith. <clears throat> and guess what it does? They lose a kind of faith, but others come to a kind of faith that they never knew was possible. I wonder if that might happen to us as we study the book of Jeremiah. I believe it is a sacred process to come to a kind of faith that we never knew was possible. Now, what we're going to do is, uh, in this introduction to how we approach the scripture, is give you two perspectives on this. This was mine, and now, in a high-tech world where we roll our chairs away, this is Caleb's. Well, that was fancy. <laughs> we are, uh, as we enter into this uh, process that we do every time we start a big book, Mark mentioned the book of Jeremiah. Uh, we always do this thing where we talk about this uh, $10 theological literary word, uh, hermeneutic, which is very simply just how we read, how we read anything. Um, and I remember as I came into the Crossings community, uh, this is back in 2011, um, I came on to be a resident to essentially learn to see how Crossings did things with the intention of me going off somewhere to some other church, planting a church. Um, and I ended up staying in this community in large part due to the way that we read stories together, the way that we approach this in a gathering, the way that we read scripture. And I remember just being blown away with how different this approach was in the context of faith from what I had grown up with. And it wasn't necessarily anything wrong with the church that I grew up in. The people were all fantastic, but the way they approached the story was so different. Uh, I probably still need to go back to people that I talked to in high school about the Bible because of the way I approached it back then. Uh, but this approach that I learned at Crossings, this new approach to the story, I was totally enamored with. This way of asking questions of the Bible, uh, letting the Bible unset me, the story, wrestling with doubt in the midst of the story, being okay with not knowing. These are all things that I started to learn uh, coming fresh out of Johnson University, not really knowing how to do this for myself, still trying to figure this out. But the whole idea that we as a faith community have this DNA where the idea of questioning and wrestling with ideas isn't something to avoid, but is actually part of helping people find their way back to God, helping ourselves get back to God. That was completely new to me. Um, and I remember, uh, I think the first book that we studied whenever I was here on uh, Crossing Staff was the book of Luke. And I remember Mark saying, a good teaching leaves you with more questions than answers. And that was so not the way that I came to the story. Um, but it became such a part of the way that I approached the Bible that in many ways I would say uh, to, to talk about what Mark was saying earlier with Barbara Brown Taylor and the way we curate the story. Had I not learned a different way to curate, had I not learned about the ways that I had unintentionally, unconsciously read the Bible before. What happened in the six years after I left Crossings to go to graduate school would have completely undone me. Um, so my experience um, after I left Crossings on staff in 2013, I started a graduate degree in the Hebrew Bible uh, at a place in Cincinnati called Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. And as you can guess by the name, that is not a Christian seminary. <laughs> so the experience essentially was uh, that I, as a grad student, actually studied with uh, rabbinical students, Jewish students who were going to become congregational leaders in the rabbinic reform movement. So I had this professor who uh, was kind of a radical deconstructionist. Everything was about tearing down these uh, well thought out theological edifices that we've constructed and his whole goal was to teach us a different way of looking at the Bible from not just a Jewish perspective, but a historical perspective, a critical perspective. And he took great joy in knocking down these constructions that we all had. Um, and I remember sitting next to a fellow classmate who came from a completely different background from me. Uh, as I'm coming back from crossings where questions 
are encouraged and doubt is a part of the story, part of wrestling. Uh, this guy came from a sort of a different curation of the story, uh, a place of knowing what the answer was, challenging those who would contest that different perspective. And uh, our experiences were completely different in this class. Uh, I was there to listen. I was willing to deconstruct. I was real willing to reconstruct after class based on this new stuff that I'd learned. And his experience was mostly about challenging the professor in the classroom, which was really awkward sitting next to me. But we ended up taking every class with this professor from there on out. Once a semester, we'd have a class with this professor. And we each made this professor our dissertation advisor. And I found out after comprehensive exams, we were talking in the library one day, that he had completely walked away from faith, like he had stopped being a Christian. Because the hermeneutic that he had before grad school couldn't support the new information, couldn't support the reframing, the ambiguity. And then I somehow ended up coming back to be a pastor, even though we had the same experiences, same classroom, same teacher. So I'm, I'm very convinced that the way that we read the story matters. And it matters that we consciously make ourselves aware of how we do that. Try to eliminate these blind spots that we might have. So maybe if you've been a part of Crossing for a long time, you've heard what we're about to talk about for 10 different times throughout the seasons. Maybe you've never heard this before. But it's important for us as a community that we're upfront with how we read the story. And this is our approach. This is some of the, the staples that we believe go into how we approach communally reading the story together. The first is that this is somehow one story, one story from beginning to end of God putting his family back together. And while that's uh, sometimes difficult with the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, uh, we still believe it's one story. What I love about the Bible, but particularly the Old Testament, where we're going to study in Jeremiah, is that it is one story altogether, but there are multiple storytellers that each author contributes a different voice, a different perspective, and sometimes maybe contrasting or opposing views of the same thing, but they still belong together in the same story. Um, in After Evangelicalism, uh, Author David Gushy says this about the difference between the Hebrew Bible and the way uh, sometimes Christians read the New, Te the New Testament or Old Testament. He says, the Bible, particularly the Hebrew Bible, records the dialogue between God and God's people. It also records the dialogues among God's people. So this isn't just a narration from on high, but this is many different voices, a symphony coming together in conversation to figure out how to find our way back to God. And, and we believe that. We believe that it's one story, but we also appreciate the multitude of voices that contribute to that single narrative. Uh, the other thing that we believe is that not only is it just one story, but it's also our story. Uh, there's this uh, professor of the Old Testament, James Muhlenberg, who we quote almost every time we do one of these big book studies, who says, until you can read the story of Adam and Eve, of Abraham and Sarah, of David and Bathsheba, and we could add Jeremiah. As your own story, you have not really understood it. This isn't just a list of facts. There's not just information for us to download. If we can't identify with the character, if we can't put ourselves in the situation and see how this narrative is a part of us as well, then we're just reading another book. And we think that this book is supposed to be read differently. This story does something to us. And as a part of that, our, the next piece is that we're always looking for God in the story. Uh, Eugene Peterson said, it's far too common for us uh, to develop among us a problem-solving habit of approach to the Bible. That we're always looking for answers, that we think that the Bible is an answer book and that we just keep going back to it. Sometimes, in order to see God, in order to find God in the story, we need to pay attention to where we're troubled, where we're confused, where, or where we're surprised by the story. 
this story that we thought we knew, but maybe didn't. And maybe that's where we see God passing through the story. But we're always on the lookout for what God happens to be doing in the story we're reading. And then finally, uh, we want to own the story. We want this to be something that we make a part of ourselves. Uh, Again, Eugene Peterson in the book, The Pastor, he talks about going to seminary and meeting this professor that radically shaped the way he looked at the story and, and why that was. I'll just read a little bit here. He says, I grew up in a Christian home and was familiar from an early age with the Bible. Maybe some of you can relate to that. I read it daily, memorized it, and on entering adolescence, argued with my friends over it. But quite frankly, I wasn't really fond of it. I knew it was important, knew it was God's word to tell the truth, though. I was bored with it. More often than not, it was a field of contention, providing material for truths that were contested by warring factions. Or it was reduced to the rules and principles that promised to keep me out of moral potholes. Or, and this is worst of all, it was flattened into cliches and slogans and sentimental God talk intended to inspire and motivate. It took only three or four weeks in Professor Trena's classroom to become aware of a seismic change beginning to take place within me regarding the Bible. Until now, I and all the people I associated with had treated the Bible as something to be used as a textbook with information about God, used as a handbook to lead people to salvation, used as a weapon to defeat the devil and all his angels, used as an antidepressant. And now incrementally, week by week, semester by semester, my reading of the Bible was becoming a conversation. I was no longer reading the words. I was listening to the voices. I was observing how these words worked in association with all the other words on the page And I was learning to listen carefully to these voices, these writers who were, well, writers. Skilled writers, poets, and storytellers who were artists of language. Isaiah and David were poets. Matthew and Luke were masters of the art of narrative. Words were not just words. Words were holy. As we, as we enter into the story, as we try to figure out where we are in the story, as we look for God and try to own this story, these aren't just words. These are sacred words that somehow we hold apart, that we set aside as different. This is not a catalog of God facts. This isn't information to be weaponized. This is a story that's supposed to do something in us and to us. And that's what we think this is all about. Somebody needs a rope to pull me over. <laughs> so, uh, one of these things that we really want to emphasize is, as we kind of land some of this, is that we want to study this book together. That, that there is something unique about journeying together uh, in into a book like this as a faith community. And so, to give you a picture of <laughs> of what I think is our way of journeying together. Uh, I heard this story. I just read it last week. I heard it a few weeks ago. But, um, yeah, here's a picture of what I'm talking about. A few years ago, the designer and engineer Peter Skillman held a competition. Uh, you've probably heard a story similar to this. Over several months, he assembled a series of four-person groups at Stanford University, University of California, and University of Tokyo, and a few other places. He challenged each group to build the tallest possible structure using the following items. My guess is some of you have actually done. 20 pieces of uncooked spaghetti, one yard of transparent tape, one yard of string, and one standard size marshmallow. The contest had one rule. The marshmallow had to end up on top. The fascinating part of the experiment, however, had less to do with the task than with the participants. Some of the team, some of the teams consisted of business school students. The others consisted of kindergartners. The business students got work right to work. They began talking and thinking strategically. They examined the materials. They tossed back ideas back and forth and asked thoughtful, savvy questions. They generated several options, then honed the most promising ideas. It was a professional, rational, and intelligent. It was very professional, very rational, very intelligent. 
The process resulted in a decision to pursue one particular strategy, then they divided up the task and they started building their marshmallow tower. The kindergartners took a different approach. They did not strategize. They did not analyze or share experiences. They did not propose, quest, uh, propose options or hone ideas. In fact, they barely talked at all. They stood very close to one another. Their interactions were not smooth or organized. They abruptly grabbed materials from one another and started building, following no plan or strategy. When they spoke, they spoke in show, short bursts. Here, no, no, here, no, here. Their entire technique might be described as trying a bunch of stuff, to, of tying a bunch, a bunch of stuff together. Now, if you had to bet which of these teams would win the competition, it would not be a difficult choice. You would bet on the business school students because they possess the intelligence, the skills, and the experience to do a superior job. This is the way we normally think about group performance. We presume skilled individuals will combine to produce skilled performance in the way we presume two plus two will combine to produce four. Your bet would be wrong. <laughs> in dozens of trials, kindergartners built structures that averaged 26 inches tall, while business school students built structures that averaged less than 10 inches. The result is hard to absorb because it feels like an illusion. I had a hard time believing this, honestly, as I read this, but then I did the research on it, and then I listened to what Daniel Coyle wrote. He said, we see smart, experienced business school students, and we find it difficult to imagine that they would combine to produce such a poor performance. We see unsophisticated, inexperienced kindergartners, and we find it difficult to imagine that they would combine to produce a successful performance. But this illusion, like every illusion, happens because our instincts have led us to focus on the wrong details. We focus on what we can see, individual skills, but individual skills are not what matters. What matters is interaction. The business school students appear to be collaborating. But in fact, they are engaged in a process psychologists call status management. They are figuring out where they fit into the larger picture. Who is in charge? Is it okay to criticize someone's ideas? What, what are the rules here? Their interactions appear smooth, but their underlying behavior is riddled with inefficiency, hesitation, and subtle competition. Instead of focusing on the task, they are navigating their uncertainty about one another. They spend so much time managing status they fail to grasp the essence of the problem. The marshmallows are relatively heavy, and the spaghetti is hard to secure. As a result, their first efforts often collapse, and they run out of time. The actions of the kindergartners appear disorganized on the surface. But when you view them as a single entity, their behavior is efficient and effective. They are not competing for status. They stand shoulder to shoulder and work energetically together. They move quickly, spotting problems and offering help. They experiment, take risks, and notice outcomes which guides them towards effective solutions. The kindergartners succeed not because they are smarter, but because they work together in a smarter way. They are tapping into a simple and powerful method in which a group of ordinary people can create something far beyond the sum of you know what, we need to wrestle with this book of Jeremiah together. Um, Caleb is unbelievably smart. Smarter than I will ever be when it comes to these Hebrew scriptures, and, and, and especially Jeremiah. I can't tell you how much time he has put into this. But you know what? He ain't your Bible answer man. You're not going to go to him to find out all the answers about how to understand Jeremiah. And any of us, and there'll be a few of us that teach in Jeremiah as we go through these weeks together, it's what we say every time we start a book. We know just enough to know that we don't know as much as we should know. And we will not, as Caleb says, focus on the answers to your questions. Our focus is on the getting you to ask good questions. If you leave with more questions and answers, we will have succeeded. All we're trying to do, like kindergartners, together, shoulder to shoulder, is enter into this unfolding narrative together and just start the conversation about this story that changes our lives. Just give the first word, not the last. Not to stand from on high and say, this is how you should think. But instead, to stand together and say, all right, we may not know a whole lot, but I think something can be accomplished with us learning this, wrestling with this, asking questions together, shoulder to shoulder, 
as we pursue this conversation about this story that makes sense of our world. Okay. So for the next 16 weeks or so, um, not counting a break for Advent, we are going to be entering into this book of Jeremiah from the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. And uh, I understand as well as anybody, um, before I went to grad school, this was not a book that I knew whole. I, I didn't know the whole scope of the story. And I don't expect many in our community have either. Um, maybe we know special verses. Uh, there's one in Jeremiah 29 that you see uh, embroidered on blankets or uh, written on a sign or on t-shirts that says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you. Uh, it's a great verse. But what we are going to understand, perhaps in this case, is that it was written in the context of something that was tragic and dark. Exile. Forced relocation from home. And in the context of the story, it's about a group of people wrestling with whether or not this exile is going to last a long time or not. Whether or not this was part of God's plan or part of God's punishment. And at the end of the day, including this line, this well-known line from Jeremiah, maybe, the book of Jeremiah was a word from God to a community of people who are trying to make sense of the world that they're living in, trying to make sense of their story and where in the world God might be in the midst of that. And so I think Jeremiah is going to challenge us. Uh, I think Jeremiah is a story we need maybe now more than ever, um, but it's going to challenge us because it's a medium that we're not used to reading. It's, it's a kind of genre, prophecy, poetry, more than narrative. And that's just not something that we have a lot of experience with. The context between our culture and their society is so much different and in many ways very similar. But it's often hard to cross that gap. And finding our place in the story is going to be difficult. To be honest, sometimes we're going to realize that we as Americans living in the 21st century are much more in line in the story with the Babylonian empire that was oppressing Jeremiah and the Israelites than the refugees from Jerusalem that are in the story that this story was written for and to. On the other side of that, maybe you'll realize that you've been feeling like an exile in your own faith tradition for years without the language to express it and maybe Hopefully, Jeremiah will give you some kind of language and license to start to see yourself and see God in the story of your experience. Uh, there's a guy named Wayne Booth uh, who wrote a book called The Company We Keep. And the book is really a plea uh, to make sure that the stories that we have on our libraries, in our heads, are all ethical stories, stories that make us better people, stories that encourage us to see the world in a more just and ethical sense. Friends is how he wants us to see them, who make us better. And Jeremiah, I think, is a friend that we need, but a friend, maybe you have one of these, who you go to to bluntly tell you how it is. Maybe in a startling way, in a way that no one else that you're friends with will do for you. But I truly am convinced that if we don't enter into this story, if we don't see what Jeremiah has to say to us, uh, we will be missing out on a friend who has something to say to us that will change us, change the world that we're living in. And I don't think that we can afford to not listen to and keep company with Jeremiah. So as we conclude this week of hermeneutics, as we talk about where we're going, and as we prepare to enter into this new, different story, we wish for you uh, this experience of newness, this surprise that we need to keep company with someone who will bring us one step closer back to the way it was intended to be. So one thing that we do every week when we gather is we gather around a table, whether metaphorically or literally in the case of this virtual gathering, and we sit around a table uh, this table that we hold common meal together with. And the elements are simply uh, bread and juice or maybe wine. These, these elements that are the blood and the body of this Jesus. But as Mark was talking about, most of what Jesus came to do, most, most of what this story is about, is about giving people 
an image of God that they've never seen before. And this common meal actually breaks down to an image of God that people had never seen before. They were familiar with the elements. The meal itself was a memorial of what happened as the Israelite people moved out of slavery into freedom, as they left Egypt behind into the wilderness that led to the promised land. And so as Jesus and his family and his countrymen would set, celebrate this meal every year, there was this traditional meaning that it symbolized our release from slavery in Egypt towards this promise that we're still awaiting some kind of fulfillment for. But it's at this meal that Jesus takes these elements, takes that story, and gives them a different way of seeing it. This way in which his own body becomes the stage upon which that drama is played. And he invites his disciples and any who would come and follow him into that journey, this journey of sacrifice, but also through the death, a resurrection, uh, through the wilderness and slavery, a new hope, a new promise for shalom, the way it was intended to be. And so as we think about the way that we look at our world, as we think about the way that we look at the story of God, we invite you in community together to consider this new image of what God is trying to give you, this, this new way of looking at both the world, your story, and God's story as we gather around the table to take common meal. Uh, we invite you to pause this video now or take it throughout the next song that we'll play, but we invite you now to enter into that new picture of God's reality.
So before you turn this off and kind of go about your day, I want to remind you uh, what I reminded you of at the beginning, and that is the place God calls the church to is the place that um, finds itself in places where God is already at work. May we be people who are looking uh, for the ways God is at work in the world around us. If you'd like to stay connected with what's going on at Crossings, the best, easiest way to do that is to uh, email me, molly at, com- molly at crossingsknoxville.com, and we can put you on our weekly email list. If you would like to kind of join us with giving, um, giving back to God, we call it kind of connect your resources with what we think God is doing uh, at Crossings, helping people find their way back to God. You can send a check into the office or you can, um, there's a link on our website that you can do it that way. Uh, And finally, we are super excited. Next week, we begin our long study of the book of the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah. Uh, We are excited for what this means for our community. We are excited to get into this rhythm uh, that feels very natural for us as a community. So we are going to start that next week on the 19th as we gather in person at Christenberry Elementary School in the evening and at the square room on Sunday mornings. And we will also do that here on the YouTube videos. We're going to be sending out this week uh, in that weekly email, but also probably in our Facebook page, um, a study guide that's going to go along with that um, that series that we will do together. Uh, and so um, we're going to wish each other, bless each other with this Hebrew word that we bless each other with every Sunday. Uh, and then we kind of have a, a quick video to show you to kind of prepare you for Uh, what's coming in this Old Testament study of Jeremiah. So we leave you today. We leave each other um, with this blessing, with this prayer and this hope for peace and restoration and wholeness. May your life be the way God intended it. Shalom.